And I'm going to welcome my friend Joy tonight. So excited. I think there is someone bringing the podium out. I don't know if Kyle, you are awesome. See, that's why we need guys here, right? So this is my, one of my dear, dear friends, Joy, and her and her husband are actually on our board too, but we love them so much and just so honored that she would come here tonight, and she's just such a precious gift to me, such a good friend, and so just very thankful. So let's give her a hand clap as she comes to minister. just to kind of talk a little bit about how we know Nate and Evan and give just a little bit of a background on Trey and I. Um, we've been on their board for, I think it's been five years. And before that, we met them um, at the Legacy Summit with the Pearsons. And I just remember Sarah being like, you've got to meet Nate and Evan. You and Trey are going to hit it off. And of course, Nate and Trey started talking hunting automatically, and then you know it's downhill from there. And and then Evan and I just became close over time, and um, just it's been such a blessing just to be it was such a divine connection and friendship, and then um, just so grateful just to be a part and just see what God is doing in this church. And I just have to say I want to honor them because God is doing so much. And it's just been incredible to watch just the journey over the last five years and just to see what God has done. And um, I just have to tell you, you are in a safe place. Like, you can trust these pastors. They really, really care about not just, um, like, they really care about the end result for your lives and for your futures. And they really care about um, things going well and you're, you're good. Like, you can trust that. And I've just seen them walk through so many scenarios where they have been faithful, uh, where they have been patient, where they have could, have could have gotten frustrated, but they care so much about the person that they would walk through things and just make sure that it, you know people transition well or whatever it is. They really have a heart to see good, and you know. So anyway, Amen. I just want to honor them. We love them so much, and Evan's such a gift to me. Um, and then. As you can see, that's my family. Those are my kiddos. Um, my oldest is Grace, and she's going to be 14 this month, which is just scary. And then <laughs> Hope is second. She's 12. Joshua is eight, and Mercy is six. And um, they're just my heart. They're the best gift to me. Um, so I'm going to – I haven't done this before, so I'm going to give you a little background story on me and Trey and how we met and so um, Trey and I kind of met in youth group um, actually I'll back up a little bit I'm not going to go into huge detail but I'm just going to give a little backstory on us so our parents met at a bed and breakfast and that's how we got to know their families and then from there um, I, we kind of grew up going to their farm and they had this thing called ranch day for Jesus and they had um, like games and all kind of stuff for the kids, and then they would feed them and give a message at the end, and um, the kids would give their lives to the Lord. So I would go and serve, and um, so when we first met his family, I want to say I was around 12, 13 years old, and Trey's like three and a half years older than me. So at the time, it was like, you know, that's a big age gap when you're that young. You know what I mean? It was like they're not even aware that you exist, which is fine. <laughs> But um, anyways, I guess at Ranch Day for Jesus, I was around 16 years old, and he saw me, and he was like, wow, okay, she grew up, and, um, and he started kind of trying to pursue me that day, and I was thinking, dude, I'm 16, and do you know my parents? <laughs> like, this is not going to happen. Um, so that became, poor guy, a really long journey of pursuing, and not a whole lot on the other end other than friendship and um but he was determined so I was involved in youth group and was doing like small groups and he um decided he was going to come and bring like his college-age friends to my small group uh, which was 
not super fun for me. I was like, well, if you're going to come, then you're going to speak. So you have to speak. And he just kept chasing me. And long story short, um, obviously, we got married. I married my best friend. He caught me, finally got it. Um, and then, yeah, so since then, we, I mean, I was serving in the youth group. And um, we both really got involved in youth group and, and leading ministry and that kind of thing. And um, probably six or seven years of that while working jobs, we just like really full-time gave our hearts to that. And um, before he knew it, he probably had around 100 people that he was mentoring, discipling, the same for me. And they were like, well, we need to just hire you guys. Um, so actually, Trey went on staff, and I began to you know, still work full-time. And um, we did youth ministry for probably about eight years. And then we senior pastored for two. And um, then that kind of ended, and the Lord brought us into a season of doing a missions ministry, basically like a rehabilitation Christian ministry for men and helping them just get back on their feet, um, pouring the word of God in them and helping them just to learn a trade and so they could go back and succeed in life and, and do well. So then um, from there, the Lord just started putting on my heart. I um, so when we were pastoring worship, I mean, leading um, in ministry, I would lead worship and that kind of thing. And so when we left um, the church and started doing the missions ministry, I was like, it was a great thing for Trey, a great outlet for him. But I was kind of feeling like, um, well, I don't really know how I fit in this. You know what I mean? I need something. And so um, I did get involved in worship at our church that we were involved in and connected in. And then... Um, the Lord put in my heart to do this school. They had a, um, a worship school through Bethel. And so I did that online. And at that point, the Lord really just started speaking to me about us moving to um, California, which at the time I was like, I don't even know where Bethel is. But I felt like the Lord showed me this picture of my family. He said, you're going to be there one day. And um, I was like, wow, I, you know, I'm going to go tell Trey right now. And so I did. I didn't exactly get the response um, that I wanted. He was like, that's never going to happen. I'm never leaving Louisiana. Please don't even pray about it. Please don't pray about it. Um, like, no, end of story. And I was like, okay, Lord, you heard him. If you want it to happen, like, I'm just going to put this back on you. And I just went all the life. So I was like, I'm not going to nag. I mean, if this is God, he can make it happen. And... Um, Fast forward two years, and um, he was about to transition the ministry and hand it over to the guy that was working for us and take a job in his dad's company as a vice president. And I just, um, it would have been a great thing financially and just, you know, a lot of great benefits, but I just did not have peace about it. And I was just feeling like, I know where this road ends, and it's just, it's here, and I just don't. I just don't see it. And, but I wouldn't really, I wouldn't tell Trey that because I just wanted him to, you know, like he knew I wasn't crazy about the idea, but I really wanted the Lord to speak to him. And long story short, we sat across each other at a table one night and he was like, okay. I mean, there was a lot in between that, but at the table he was like, all right, what do you want then? If you don't want this, you know, what do you want? It's your turn. I've done everything I've really wanted to do. In that time as well, he had launched a hunting business and, um, and I wasn't even really prepared to answer that question because I had given that whole thing over to God. And so it had been a while. And um, anyway, it was just like almost like the Lord unction in that moment. The Holy Spirit just brought that out of me. And I literally just said, I want to move to California and raise our kids in that environment. Or Beth, I think I just said, I want to move to Bethel because I didn't even know where it was. And he was just like, okay. And for the first time, it was like his eyes opened, and I could see, like, something hit him. And it wasn't me just telling him something, like, the Lord was on it. And, um, and that just began our journey of, um, so we moved to Redding, California. Um, it'll be five years next month, which is crazy to think, five years, wow. Um, and the Lord just... You know, sometimes you make a choice and the Lord is on something and you're like, I don't even fully know exactly why we're doing this other than I know my children are going to be benefited from being here. I know our family is going to be benefited from being here. But we don't always know the full picture. You know, we don't know the full story or the full reason God had us, us there. So it's just been a season of 
just being in this environment, uh, what God is doing there. How many of you know what Bethel is and or Bethel music or have listened to their worship? So just being in that environment and receiving, and I did ministry school about two years ago, and that was amazing. So that's kind of a little bit about us, and um, my husband launched a business there. We're doing that, and um, just taking one day at a time, hearing from the Lord and, and bringing us on this journey. I will add one other thing that's happened since then. Um, so we... I got this really amazing idea. Um, probably around March. Um, so, the little backstory: we we had a beautiful house we renovated, and then we. Um, it's a whole story with that, but we basically almost pretty much have it sold. We had moved into a rental, and then our rental lease was coming up to a close, and I just was like all right, Lord, what's next? Like, are we going to stay in this rental? We don't really want to buy until this sale fully goes through. Um, it's kind of a lease-to-own type scenario. You know, what do you have? Like, what's next? And I just kept, we went back and forth. I looked at all kind of different rentals all over Reading and, and different things. And then this idea kept popping in my head about living in an RV. <laughs> and I was like, I told Trey, and of course he was like, absolutely not, you know, like, <laughs> like, no. And then I was like, I just want to test it on our kids just to see how they're going to respond. So I ended up, like, talking to my oldest daughter about it, and then she started crying, and I was like, all right, well, maybe this isn't a good idea. <laughs> and so, um, but time kept going on, and I just could not get this idea out of my head. It was like, it kept popping up like a, you know, big ball in a swimming pool. You can't keep it down. And I'm like, Lord, is this you or is this just me with a crazy idea? Like, you're going to have to really show me something because Trey's not for it. My daughter cried. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up going to visit a friend in Southern California and two of her friends um, that lived down there just moved into RVs. And I'm like, okay, is this is this what you're trying to tell me? And so anyway, all that to say, the Lord just kept drawing me into these different scenarios. Um, we had a friend that had like 80 acres that we knew. I, didn't even, I hadn't seen the land, but trade hunted on it. And I knew she lived on it, and she lived in an Airstream. And so I was thinking one day, and I'm like, um, what about her land? Like, does she still live there? Is, does she still have an Airstream? Airstream, I start asking Trey all these questions. And he's like, why do you want to know about all that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean... Maybe we could buy her Airstream and live in her land. <laughs> and he was just like, you've never even seen that land, Joy. Like, you would not want to live out there. I don't think this is what you want. And an Airstream's too small, all the things. And I'm like, I, all right, that's fine. We'll, we'll do something different. So anyway, we've been around every, you know, we've looked into every option possible, every type of RV, RV you can think of, every RV park in town we visited. And I just couldn't, like, get away from this land. I'm like, all right, well, just just text her and ask her if she's selling her airstream. So he texts her, and she's like, I mean, it's not for sale, but I'll sell it to you. And so um, I knew that was an option. And then I was like, well, what about her land? Is is it available? We found out his family is staying on the land. I'm taking way too long in this story. So all that to say, this land that I'd never seen, that I just kept feeling drawn to, was going to be available right when this other family was moving out. They Actually, a family with six kids was living in an RV on this property before us. And so all that to say, I know this sounds really crazy, like who on earth would sign up for this idea, but we did, and we live in an Airstream on 80 acres, and <laughs> it's been an adventure. Um, but it's, you know, there's so much of God in it. I wanted to renovate something I love, interior design and decor. It gave me that outlet. Um, and then we want to be able to travel more and do things with our kids. And really, I think the biggest thing for me is just to, to downsize and to go through that process of just getting rid of so many things and just focusing in on what's right in front of us is really big for me. And I just felt like, you know, we have four years left with Grace until she's 18. And I don't know if she'll stay or she's going to go or what's going to happen, but I just... I want to give her the best years of her life. I want to focus in and be present. And um, so anyway, it's, it's really been a good thing. It doesn't come without its challenges. 
But so yeah, just so you know, that's that's our latest adventure. <laughs> that's what we're doing right now. So I was actually really grateful to come stay at Evan's house <laughs> and take a bath. It was amazing. So no, it was great to be here. Um, okay. I want to get into our word tonight. Um, I really felt like the Lord wanted to speak on, or wanted me to speak on, staying in the lane of grace. And um, I'm going to kind of preface with this. I feel like um, I don't want that to come across like, you know, if you get out of the lane of grace, then, you know, it's, it's trouble. Because I just feel like God is not this high stakes God. I don't know if that makes sense, but he's not so high stakes that he can't redeem, he can't reroute, he can't restore when we get off. I think he actually, he's not surprised that we miss the exit or that we swerve into the next lane or whatever. He's prepared for it. And he's so prepared and he's so good that he's ready to reroute, he's ready to redeem, he's ready to restore. And it's actually a part of his plan and his glory because he gets to show off in our lives and go, hey, that's okay guess what? I'm really good at redeeming. I'm really good at restoring. I'm really good at rerouting you. So for me, that's always just like, I, I just love knowing that about God. We can mess it up, but he's good at cleaning up messes. Yeah. So, um, all right. So the first thing I want to talk about, and um, with staying in the late of grace, I'm, I'm really more going to talk about what are some things that veer us out of that lane. Because um, the, the grace lane is the sweet spot. It is the place the Lord wants us to learn to stay. And it's out of a place of everything that the Lord tells us, commands us, or you know, gives us instructions on is usually out of love. It's out of protection that he cares so much about us. He's like, hey, stay in this lane because it's the best one to stay in. And he can fix it if we get off. But So some things that I've just been learning that kind of veer us out of that lane of grace. And the first point is pressure. So if you're taking notes, you can write pressure. How many of you know we all need a little bit of pressure? I don't know about you, but like if we didn't have a time the kids had to be at school or I didn't have, you know, certain things that we had deadlines or timelines, I might not, I might not ever get there. You know what I mean? We need a little bit of pressure. It takes a little bit of pressure to get toothpaste out. Um, but I'm talking about the kind of pressure that causes us to, like, make the wrong choice because we feel under this crazy pressure. How many of you have had pressures? How many know there's lots of pressure we can have in life, whether it's financial, um, uh, gosh, timelines, deadlines, all these different things, we can start feeling the pressure. And I like to think of, um, in football, um, I'm thinking of this scenario because I played like a family football game with my kids and some people Sunday. And um, so like the quarterback, you know, he's, he has to throw the ball. And when people come in to rush him, to throw or pressure him, when it gets to that point, if he hasn't thrown it already, typically it doesn't go very well, right? Unless he's just really good at throwing under pressure, or good at throwing under that rush. And I, I feel like it's like that. We, when we get pressured, or rush to make choices or decisions or we feel backed up against a wall or whatever it is, um, it can cause us to veer out of grace. And um, how many of you know like our timeline is usually different than God's timeline? Um, That's been a big one for me to learn. I think about, well, I won't go into that story because I want to be able to get through these points. But um, I had a scenario that I was just going to give an example with. So with our Airstream, we had, we got back from vacation with Evan and Nate, and then it was like hit the ground running because we had to get this Airstream renovated. We were moving out of our rental. I had to downsize everything, garage sales, the whole nine yards, for six people to fit in the Airstream. So all this at one time, and, and I put myself in this scenario. It wasn't anybody else's fault. It was my fault. But... Um, so when it came to start trying to find somebody to hire for this process, we thought we had a guy lined up, and he ends up, that ends up falling through. And so I was like, great, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So I start interviewing different people for this job, and um, anyway, several different people co- came, and there was this one guy who had supposedly done tiny houses, he was a contractor, he was working for a contractor company, 
And um, everything on paper and everything on the outside felt right. Like, this guy can do this job. He was giving me, like, all the yes, you can, da, da, da. And, but at the end of the day, I just had this funny feeling, like, no, this isn't it. But how many of you know sometimes we can second guess ourselves or second guess the Holy Spirit? And we go, but no, I mean, it lines up. It all lines up. So, Lord, I'm not going to either trust this or I'm going to trust this. That could be wrong. And so, unfortunately, I was, like, feeling the pressure of we need to get this done. I need somebody who can do the job, Lord. So I'm going to trust this part. And so I hired him. And come to find out, I didn't really hire him. I hired a minimum wage guy that he was paying to do the job that didn't really know what he was doing. And it just ended up being... A week and a half, waste of time, a lot of different things. And I was just was like, oh, Lord, I can't believe I'm here at this point. Like, this is so frustrating. We already have a timeline. We already, you know, so many different things. And But I feel like the Lord just spoke to me. He said, Joy, you let pressure push you to make the wrong choice. And you didn't trust that thing in you that said no. You know, because it's, it's one thing to see it on paper and go, oh, it looks great. So I wanted to read this scripture because I just feel like so many of you already know this, but it's just such a good reminder to let our peace lead. And this, this scripture is perfect. It says, it's Colossians 3.15, if you want to write it down. And this is the Amplified Classic Version. Um, I'm learning this is like one of my new favorite versions. So it says, and let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ, rule and act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ's one body you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. I'm going to read it again. It says, let the peace that comes from Christ's rule act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions. So anything you have facing you that you have to make a choice on, let God be the umpire. Let that peace be the umpire that leads you. I mean, I grew up, since I was a little girl, my parents were like, no, I don't have a peace about that. You can't go do that. Or no, you can't do that because I don't have a peace. Or whatever it was, peace always was the guide in my family. So I learned that. But even as adult, an adult, I'm having to relearn some things and go, yeah, even when everything looks perfect on the outside, I have to trust that peace. If there is no peace, it means red light. You know what I mean? This is not a green light. And it reminds me of that scripture, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your steps. There's things that we're not going to see that he's going to give us the answers to. And so um, just not allowing pressure. I think, too, like um, there's so many pressures, I think, even that young people go through with getting married, like this pressure with a timeline of age. And I think sometimes you, you might find people have made a choice in that regard because they feel the pressure of, like, I'm, I'm a certain age, i got to get married, or, or even having kids or different things. Um, okay, the next thing, and I feel like fear kind of comes under this pressure, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fear. How many know fear is a liar? Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is, I really hate fear. How many of you hate fear? Fear is, it's paralyzing, it can torture you, and the truth is, this is what the Lord says about it. Isaiah 41.10 says this, fear not, fear not, he didn't say fear a little bit if, fear a little bit when, fear a little bit if you're going through this, you can have some fear, I mean, that's real, it's realistic, that's a real situation you could be fearful about. He just said fear not. In fact, he said, there is nothing to fear. Like, he said it. I'm not saying it. This is God's word. He said, there is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. And I just love that because he's so point blank on it. Like, there is nothing to fear. Obviously, we have situations in life where fear is going to 
be staring us in the face or come knocking at our door. And we're always going to have an open opportunity to open the door, to allow thoughts to come in. And it's just not worth it. It's really not worth it. Um, how can we fear not? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this. Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. And the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which, with, I'm sorry, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. So it's giving us a tool here. Do not be anxious, but pray. Don't be fearful, but pray. There is a key. There is a tool. So when fear comes, it should be an automatic, like, it should be an automatic button in us. We go, all right, I'm praying right now. When that fear comes knocking, all right, I know what to do. I'm praying. Um, the other night, my son, Trey, has been doing, like, some um, hunting trips and guiding people, and so He's been gone for probably the longest he's been gone. Um, let's see, it's probably, what, day 19 now? Today's day 19. Um, and so my younger two, haven't seen him anyway, and one night he was like, Mom, I just have this bad feeling. And I was like, what do you have a bad feeling about? I'm scared. And I was like, well, what are you scared about? I feel like something bad's going to happen to Dad. And my daughter chimed in right before I could even say anything. And she was like, Joshua, that's just fear. And you just need to pray right now. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yep, let's do what she said. <laughs> so we just sat there and we just prayed. And it was like, of course, what happens is peace just comes in the room. And I don't know if something was going to happen or not. I don't know if there was something that we really did need to pray for. But I do know peace came and nothing happened that I know of, you know, I never even asked him, but I just think it's such a good reminder, like when fear comes, just pray, and peace will come, and also, well, let me get through this scripture, I wanted to read a different version, it's the Passion Translation, it says, don't fret or worry, instead of worrying, pray, let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. I just love how it says that. Um, and prayer can change things. Prayer isn't just, you know, let's pray so peace can come and we'll be okay. Pray, prayer works. <laughs> prayer changes things. Um, I love, you know, that Jesus gave the greatest example of that in the Bible. And... How many of you know the story where his disciples were all afraid, and what was Jesus doing? Do y'all know what story I'm talking about? He was napping. He was sleeping. And I just think it's so funny because it makes me think, like, if Jesus was on the earth today, I think so many people wouldn't even recognize it, and they'd probably be offended by him, right? Because here's Jesus. He's in the boat in the middle of a storm, in the middle of waves and lightning and all of these things happening, chaos, and the guys, the disciples really thought they were going to die and go under, and Jesus is taking a nap. <laughs> and he comes out and he's like, where's your faith? But he said, look, we're going to pray. And he prays, and he causes the winds and the waves and everything to cease and completely stop. And um, he shows us a perfect example of what to do when there's a storm, when there's fear, he rebuked it. He rebuked the waves. He rebuked the wind and the storm. And guess what? And he also told them, like, you have the same authority to do this. Like, you can do this. A rebuke the storm. Rebuke the waves. Rebuke the lightning. And um, so just a good reminder. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is performance. Um... And again, like some of these words might be confusing because obviously we all have to perform to a certain extent, right? We have to perform as a mom. We have to perform as a wife. And I don't mean like, you know what I mean? We have to perform in our job. Like there's things that are required of us that we have to perform. Um, but I'm talking about the kind of performance that's like the performing for identity instead of from identity. Yeah. Performing um, for 
in, instead of from. And I just believe God wants to take us to a place where we know so much of who we are that it doesn't, our identity is not wrapped up in what we do, who we know, what we have, these things that cause us to feel secure. Because what happens if we lose one of those things? What happens if you lose that title? What if, happens if you lose that home or those things or whatever it is? Um, and I, I feel like there's something that comes with that. And I feel like maybe even as women, we can deal with this, that feeling of just not being enough if we don't have these things. And that feeling of not being enough is so rooted in, in shame, actually. Um, and shame is not, shame isn't guilt, like because we've done something wrong. Shame is actually um, feeling like you are wrong, or there's something wrong with you, or you are not enough. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure shame probably entered the world when Adam and Eve were in the garden. They sinned, and then they hid themselves. And instead of repenting and being restored, I believe they allowed shame to cause them to feel like they had to cover themselves, and they had to start wrapping these things around. And I think that can happen in life really easily. That we, um, whether it's something we've done or something's done to us, or whether it's just feeling not enough, shame can begin to wrap around us and cause us to be hidden and to try and hide ourselves or to isolate ourselves. And I just believe that God wants to uncover and strip back the layers that have kept us from being our true, authentic selves. He wants to get us back to our true and original design. Um, and I want to share a little bit about that because um, I've been on my own journey of those things. And I think, um, so my husband and I were, were pastors. I mentioned that. We were youth pastors and then we senior pastor for a couple years. And um, the pastor that had handed the church over to us decided to come back and took the church back, a real sudden, crazy scenario. I won't go into all the details, but it was a real, really, really hard thing because we had been in ministry and under his ministry for, I don't even know, 10, 10 12 years. Um, and we ended up, we felt in the end just a peace to, to leave and um, felt like the Lord just said, you know, your assignment's over. Like, good job, well done, move on. And that's when we took the missions ministry. But I walked through a really hard season of, one, feeling like we were, you know, I was carrying a baby, and it was really about to give birth, as we had taken really two years just to um, see the church really heal from the last years and just different things. And we were literally in a stage of God was just redoing everything, new website, new everything was about to like come out. And we actually never even got to show anyone that because it was taken right before. So it was a season of like, wow, I feel like I, like I literally had a baby taken from me, one. Two, like title ministry, everything that I've, all I've known and done forever, all of a sudden taken. And, um, and I realized, wow, I definitely had some my identity attached to this. Like, I definitely, my identity was definitely in what I was doing and how I was ministering and, and all these things. And the Lord had to begin to really reteach me. Like, I had you on assignment, and therefore there's an anointing for that calling. There's an anointing for that assignment. But sometimes that ends, and it doesn't mean, um, you know, that you, you have lost value. It doesn't mean that you have lost um, you know, like who you are, you're still the same person, but that anointing might not be the same because you're not on the same assignment. There's not a grace there. It's okay. And so the Lord is just in that start, he began to walk me through this journey of just knowing that my value doesn't lie in what I do. My value doesn't lie in, in the title I have. The value doesn't lie in, um, I just think it's so easy for us to get wrapped up in that, whether it's being a mom or the best mom or it's in ministry, it's this title in ministry or whatever job it is or your home or whatever. The enemy, I really believe, wants us to attach our identity to those things instead of whose we are and what he's accomplished. Because how, how many of you know like Christianity is so much just about really believing in what he's already accomplished? That's it. 
It's believing in who he is and what he's done for us and being able to partake of everything that he's already done. It's really easy. <laughs> we get the best end of the deal. He did the hard work. You know what I mean? He went to the cross. He defeated the grave. He, you know what I mean? He's called us up into heavenly places to be seated with him. And he has no prerequisites except just believe. Right. This is the work. That's believe. Right. Right. And so, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off my, my message. But I just feel like um, the Lord really wants to restore that in our lives. Because I feel like the, there's power on the other side of that. Be, when we are fully emptied out of all our, what we try and grab value from or worth from or identity from or, you know, security from, all these things, then it's like he can't be strong in that place. We have to draw our strength from him knowing like he is what we have and, and there, that's where the power lies. And I really believe that we're the most powerful version of ourselves. We're the most authentic version of ourselves when we can let those things be stripped back. And, and that doesn't mean you have to lose your house and you lose titles or any of that. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. It just means that um, in those things, you're not operating and being motivated because you need this for your identity. You're operating and you're working in that place because you know whose you are and because you know the power that's been given to you right. as a person that is just going to bring glory to God in whatever they're doing. Does that make sense? Um, so I want to read the scripture. It says, it's Galatians 2.20. It says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. So that is why I don't view God's grace as something minor. Right? We don't view it as minor. It keeps going, but I'm going to stop there because I want to get through some of these points. Um, okay. I'm really not crying, but... There's something about Arkansas that makes my eyes water. <laughs> it's okay. It's something in the air, but it's all good. Y'all can think I'm crying up here. Um, okay, the third thing I want to talk about is position. Um, how many of you know knowing your position is really important? Like, and I keep going back to sports, but it's okay. Um, if you're going to play a sport, you really need to know what position you're going to be in to be able to succeed, right? So... Am I first place, second place, third place, or whatever you, however you say that? Outfield, am I infield? Like, where am I going to be? Am I quarterback? Because once you know your position, then you can own that, and you can do it well. But if you just, the other day, we didn't really have a great plan. Nobody really knew what they were doing, and we were playing, and it was fun. It was just kids, and we were playing football. But I'm like, I really like football. Um, it's like my favorite sport, and, and I like playing it. And... I was thinking, like, we need a plan here. Like, I need to know what I'm doing. They need to know what we're doing if we're going to win, right? That's the goal. And it just, <laughs> it just made me think, like, how important is our position and us knowing our position? So I want to read this scripture, Romans 5. I know I, I'm, like, got a lot of scripture in here, but I feel like it's, y'all are a word, church. Y'all like the word. Okay, Romans 5, it says, Romans 5, verse 5. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Through him also we have our access, entrance, and introduction by faith into, his, into, I'm sorry, into this grace, state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. Huh, there's a lot there. I mean, we have been given right standing with God through faith into grace. And that standing is with him. I'm going to keep going 
because there's a few things I want to cover before we end. Ephesians 2, 4 says this, But God, so rich in his mercy, because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together. I love that. He raised us up in, together with him and made us sit down together. It's just, I, my mind is always blown by the fact that he is allowed us to come and sit in heavenly places with him like he has given us that place he has given us that authority as believers and as daughters like he's not like no you're down there i'm up here you little person me big person he is like no 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 no. you're seated with me in heavenly places and come this is where you stand you're a daughter and i have to remind myself of that all the time like no 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 or the lord does you are a daughter Okay, let's see, I'm at, okay, he did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor, in his kindness and goodness of heart towards us in Christ Jesus. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, wait, am I repeating this? No, it's just the same thing, okay and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this is salvation not of yourselves, of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it's a gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It's not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in taking in glory to himself. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Wow. Yes, it's so good. He gave us a position with him. And I, I feel like I was thinking about this today. When we really know who he is, and what he's done and what he's accomplished and we just have relationship with him the more we're going to know who we are because that's where our identity comes from our identity comes from the father if you've ever seen um, kids that have not been able to be around their father or mother or have relationship with them you'll see they really struggle to know who they are they struggle to know their identity obviously god can redeem and restore that but i'm just i'm using that as an example as the opposite of that, somebody who grows up to really know their father and have a relationship with them and they're secure in that, that's going to be the most confident uh, little boy or little girl and they're going to know who they are and they're going to know whose they are and they're going to, you know what I'm saying? You, you can tell those kids because of their confidence. They know. They know whose they are. And I feel like as daughters of a king, the Lord wants us to know who he is so we can know who we are. Because everything that he is, he's like, you have access to it. You have an entrance to it. You have, I've given you access to everything that I am. And I want you to do even greater things than I have done. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. The Father gives us his identity and his grace. And he gives us a place at the table. So I wanted to read this, Romans 12, 6. It says, God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. So if God has given you the grace gift of prophecy, you must activate your gift by using the proportion of faith you have to prophesy. If your grace gift is serving, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, then be actively teaching and training others. If you have the grace gift of encouragement, then use it often to encourage encourage others. If you have the grace gift of giving to meet the needs of others, then may you prosper in your generosity without fanfare. If you have the gift of leadership, be passionate about your leadership. And if you have the gift of showing compassion, then flourish in your cheerful display. And I just, I love how it puts that, like, these are all grace gifts. Why? Because it's by his grace that we receive these gifts. And 
another thing that we have to understand constantly, it was like Evan was saying tonight, we don't have to earn it. We don't have to be qualified for it. We don't have to work for it. It's just a gift that he's given us that he is just, he's saying like, just come and take it. And I also believe there are certain gifts that, um, that he's given each one of us individually. And I feel like it's something the Lord wants us to really discover so that we can become active in that. The Lord, his desire for us is that we would not just be stripped back, and, um, but that we would, you know, sometimes the stripping back or the tearing off, I like to think of somebody who's just been wrapped in, um, like, almost like somebody back in the day when they would, um, they died and they would wrap them in those, whatever you call it, cloths. Um, he wants to unravel those places in our lives that we have hidden or felt like we don't want the world to see or this is not enough, it's not good enough. I don't, want, I don't want to put myself out there, whatever it is. And I just feel like the Lord wants to do something tonight where you feel like, where he can really just come in this room and to start unraveling those places in your life. Because there is an emptying sometimes that has to happen so that he can fill. And I feel like I've been on that journey with the Lord of just, in the natural, it's been somewhat of a stripping season because none of it was anybody else's doing and taking. It was out of choice, but just so happens I'm downsizing quite a bit. And it just so happens like my identity can't be in that house that I had and that furniture that I had anymore. And it can't be in that job title over there and it can't be in any of these things. And I, I know it's because he wants my full identity to just be in being a daughter and to be in being his. And obviously he wants us to step into our calling, to step into our identity, to step into dreams. That's his heart for us. He wants it more than we do. Um, but I think getting the foundation right, that is so key. And God is so much about the foundation. And I feel like even this church is in that season like where you have done years of foundation work and you have done years of just like layer by layer, brick by brick, like placing it perfectly. And I, I feel like the next level is just going to be crazy because you've done the foundation so well. You've laid such a great foundation and even in your own lives, I feel like the next step is just God wants to pour out. He wants you to step into those dreams and desires and callings and giftings. And I really felt today when I was um, preparing or just studying, I felt like he said there are people in the room that have dreams and desires and you're in like the waiting process. And I don't know what those things are. It could be writing a book. It could be um, a job that you've really been pursuing or ministry. It could be to be a mom. I don't know what it is, but I felt like the Lord just wanted to encourage you tonight that just trust the process. Don't get impatient and well-doing. Like, don't get impatient and go, I'm just going to abort this dream. I'm going to abort this desire because it's not going to happen out of fear of being disappointed. I'm not, I don't want to be disappointed, so I'm just going to pull back. I don't want to be disappointed in this fr friendship, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull back out of it. I don't want to be disappointed in this marriage, so I'm just not going to try anymore. I'm, I'm not going to write this, I'm not going to even dream about this book because I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want to not be enough in this scenario, whatever it is. I just feel like there's dreams and desires, and I feel like the Lord, he's on them. Like, he wants you to know he's on those things. Don't give it up, whatever it is. And it might not be everybody in the room. It might be just certain people. But don't settle. Don't settle. I just felt that really strongly. Don't settle. And it made me think of the story of Jacob and Rachel. And Rachel really wanted children. And so, so badly, though, that she settled and got Ishmael. Don't settle for the next best, best thing because what you need isn't right there. Don't settle. Don't let pressure push you. Um, don't let fear push you. Don't let shame keep you from your calling, who God's called you to be. The Lord wants us to live in a place of just the sweet spot of his grace and of his goodness and his favor. Just as much as grace is mercy, it's favor. He has favor on you. And um, I wanted us to read the scripture 
It says, um, so don't be patient for the Lord to act. Keep moving forward steadily in his ways, and he will exalt you at the right time. And when he does, you will possess every promise, including your full inheritance. You'll watch with your own eyes. I just love that. I mean, what a great scripture. Like, if this word is for you, write that down. Claim that every day. That he, you will possess every promise, including your full inheritance, and you'll watch with your own eyes. And before that, it just says, he'll exalt you at the right time. There is a right time. And I, I know, like, um, process can be hard. The journey can be challenging sometimes when you're... Um, you're believing God for things and you're wanting to see certain things happen and you're just not seeing it yet. But stay steady, stay faithful. And I just know God is going to bring the right people. God is going to open the right doors. God is going to, um, and just don't like cut yourself short of seeing it happen. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times we can be, um, it's like you shoot yourself in the foot before it actually can happen. And I just feel like the Lord wants to encourage you tonight. And he wants to just infuse some hope um, in places. Um, so I just wrote down a few, a few things I feel like the Lord wants to do. He wants to bring hope for dreams. I feel like the Lord wants, maybe there's something tonight that you just felt like there's a mindset that I've had and maybe it's not been right. And I feel like the Lord wants to change that mindset. I feel like there's some of you just, you're at a place where you're like, all right, I give up. I surrender. Like, I'm at a place of just surrender. It's not a bad place to be. It's a really good place to be. He's a, you're in good hands when you surrender. Um, I also just feel like the Lord wants to just really bring truth to some lies that maybe you've believed about yourself, maybe you've believed about even Him. Um, I went to ministry school thinking I was going to learn more about Him, and the Lord actually taught me Instead of him teaching me who he was, he taught me who he wasn't. He had to undo some lies of what I thought he was. And he's like, no, that's actually not me. That's not how I am. And there might be some places the Lord's like, you believe some things about me that are not true. And I want to bring truth to those areas. Um, maybe you've dealt with shame. Maybe that was speaking to you when I was talking about shame. Just feeling like you've needed these things to cover up who you are and you haven't felt comfortable in your own skin, you haven't felt comfortable coming out and just feeling like you're enough. Um, or fear, maybe you've just dealt with fear um, in the last season or, or whatever. It's been kind of a crazy season. Um, but whatever it is, I just wanted to play this song tonight and just allow you just to get with the Lord and and just to um, really just surrender and say, God, what is it you want to do? What do you want to do? I'm going to give you space for it. I'm going to give you time for it. Like, what do you want to come and do? I surrender. I surrender whatever mindset, whatever it is you want to come and do in me. Because the Lord, um, he only wants to come. It's, it's not like he wants to do some big heart surgery. Sometimes he's just like, hey, you got some lint on your shirt. Let's get it off. Or hey, let's fix that little tight squeeze of your pants. That's really uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm just being silly. But for real, it doesn't have to be this big thing. But God so cares about you, and he cares about the little things. So if you wouldn't mind just playing that song. And, um, and then I just want to invite anybody. If you, if you just want prayer um, and you have something specific that you need, I'm just going to kind of be in the front. And if Evan and our team want to come, I'm just we're just going to be up here just to minister and pray for you and and then I believe in just a little bit they're going to have some amazing dessert and coffee and fellowship time. So you can crank it up. 